So we will now move on to the Safavid Empire. And you can kind of think of the Safavid Empire as being roughly equivalent to Iran. It's a little bit uh, bigger in some ways, but it's, it's, again, for our purposes, is roughly equivalent. And certainly the people of Iran look back to this period as kind of a golden age. Now, you'll notice also that it is uh, in kind of a weird relationship with the Ottoman Empire. Perhaps weird isn't the right word. Perhaps complex is better. So, for example, you'll notice that the Safavid Empire controls a large part of uh, what is now Saudi Arabia, but the Ottoman Empire controls um, kind of an area around it, the cities in particular around it. But in any case, the key thing here is we're talking about the Safavid Empire, the one that is connected to modern-day Iran. Now, remember, a big part of this section is trying to understand how Islam uh, looks different, how Muslims act differently based on the historical context in which they live. And this will also help us to understand why Iran today is, in a sense, such a devoutly Shia uh, country. But this is going to be a little bit complex because we're going to be talking about the interplay between ethnicity and religion, so please bear with me. So the area of modern-day Iran, what the Safavid Empire will rule, um, it, the group of people who live there that form the majority are an ethnic group that we would call Persians, um, and they're basically roughly equivalent to Iranians today. Right. So um, if you were to ask someone from Iran, are you a Persian? They would most likely say yes. Right. And this is an ancient civilization. I mean, these guys have been, Persians have been like around forever. They were like the big enemies of the uh, Roman Empire, for instance. The Mongols, though, will conquer the Persians uh, in the 13th century or so. And they themselves will be pushed out by a Turkish group. This Turkish group will rise up and take power. Now, this creates kind of a problem, right? Because you have a Turkic group, an ethnic minority, ruling Persians, the ethnic majority. And the Persians may say, hey, we don't want to be ruled by you. We don't want to be ruled uh, by this ethnic uh, minority. Why shouldn't Persians rule Persians? So the Turks have a problem, right? That You have this Turkish group of people ruling Iranians. You have a minority ruling a majority. The majority says, hey, why don't we rule... Uh, you Turks are different from us. You have a different language. You have a different culture. Why should you be ruling us? The way the Turks dealt with this problem is interesting. <clears throat> it's similar in some ways to how the Qing, the Manchus, dealt with the Chinese. Remember, the Chinese initially said to the Manchus, you shouldn't rule us, you shouldn't govern us, govern us, you're barbarians, and the mandate of heaven would never go to a barbarian. And the Turks are going to deal with this in a way similar in a sense, to how the uh, the Qing dealt with it. Remember, the Qing dealt with this by embracing Confucianism. They found a shared kind of culture, religion, philosophy, and embraced it, and that convinced the Chinese to accept their rule. The Turks, though, are going to do something a little bit different, right? Similar in some ways, different in other ways. Because one thing the Turks will say is, well, you know, we are a different ethnic group from you, that's true, but we're all Muslims. And you know what? We Turks... The rulers, these Turkish rulers in particular, we trace our ancestry to Muhammad. And so you should follow us, even though we're a different ethnic group, because not only do we follow the same religion, we are the, uh, we, we are the descendants of Muhammad. And you know what? Let's embrace Shia Islam. Right? Let's embrace Shia Islam. Because in, remember, in Shia Islam, there's a belief that the caliph, the successor of Muhammad should trace their descent from Muhammad, right? It's not enough to just have community consensus. You should literally be descended from Muhammad. And here's the thing. It's hard to change your, you, you, it's really difficult to change your ethnicity, right? I mean, how do you change your, your culture and your language? But it's comparatively easy to change your religion. So the Turks said, okay, uh, we're all going to be Shia Muslims, right? We're all going to believe in Shia Islam. So not only will they not tolerate Christians, they will also not tolerate non-Shia Muslims. They will expect everyone to convert to Shia Islam and will put immense pressure on people to convert to Shia Islam. They do not have the opportunity to pay the tax to avoid conversion. Moreover, I want to stress, they will force non-Shia Muslims to become Shia Muslims. So Sunni Muslims will be expected to become uh, Shia Muslims. 
So the key thing here is this. They're completely ignoring the traditional Orthodox understanding of Islam, which holds that people of the book, like Christians, can pay a tax to keep their religion. And you're certainly not supposed to be forcing other Muslims to convert to your form of Islam. But they're willing to do this for political reasons. They need to do this in order to, to uh, the Turks need to do this in order to unify their people and build their empire. And this does work. They build a pretty stable empire that is able to accomplish some, some interesting cultural things. However, because they're so intolerant, people fight hard against them. For example, they are major enemies of the Ottomans, right? Remember, the Ottomans also claim to be the caliphs. You have two groups of people that came to have the caliphs, right? The Ottomans say, we have the caliph. We're the successor of Muhammad. The Safavids say, no, you're not. You're not descended from Muhammad. We're the successors of Muhammad. So they'll be fighting between them, and the Ottomans are just really powerful, and that prevents the um, the Safavids from expanding. And later we'll talk about the Mughal Empire, which was also really powerful, and it was on the other side of the Safavids, and that prevented them from expanding as well. So they are able to unify. It's going to be hard for them to expand because of their kind of intolerant position and because they're surrounded by powerful neighbors. And I don't want to just leave uh, the Safavids there. I do want to point out that they were able to make some great accomplishments in terms of art and architecture. And you can see this in particular in their beautiful capital city of Isfahan. All right, so Isfahan was the capital of the Safavid Empire. You can still go see it today. Very beautiful place uh, that kind of showcases this uh, Islamic art and architecture. So that brings us then to our final Islamic empire we're going to look at in this section, and that is the Mughals. And remember, when you think of the Mughals, think about the um, modern day India, right? They will conquer much of that government, and it will be the Mughals who will be, in a sense, pushed from power by the British when they take over India. Now, we have to kind of start this story um, talking about the northwestern part of India in Afghanistan. And I don't expect you to remember these names um, unless, except for those we've already talked about, and except for Akbar, you don't need to remember Babur or, or Humayun. But I do need to kind of tell the story. So Babar will capture much of northern India by 1526. He's come from kind of this Pakistan, Afghanistan region, and he is a Muslim conqueror, and he'll come in and conquer that territory. But his son Humayun is forced to flee in 1540. With the help, though, of the Safavids, he will return to India and retake a very important city called Delhi in 1555. However, he will die uh, shortly after that in 1556, right? So Humayun will die in 1556. And there's different accounts, but the, uh, supposedly he either fell down some stairs and died or he fell off a roof and died. You may notice I'm saying fell in a kind of sarcastic way. That's because he was likely pushed. Right, he was likely pushed. The guy was uh, not very competent. He was, uh, it would seem, addicted to opium. And so some people decided that they would rather get rid of him. And so it's likely that he was assassinated. And he was uh, succeeded by his young son, Akbar, who was only 14 years old. And if you're a Star Wars fan, uh, yes, that uh, I believe Akbar, Admiral Akbar is named after this Akbar. Now, what's really striking about this, like I said, Akbar is only 14 years old and he becomes uh, the ruler of the Mughals, right? He becomes the ruler of the Mughals, a ruler of some territory at the age of 14. And, and you can think about that. Imagine this, you know, you're like the equivalent of like a freshman in high school and all of a sudden you have to be king. And then imagine that the reason you become, become king is because someone killed your dad and you know that they're still out there and they will likely kill you if you are not able to kind of take power and be really smart, right? So very scary position uh, this young ruler found himself in, this Akbar, but he's going to do very well despite his difficult circumstances. So um, I just want to highlight the reason I'm kind of telling you this story about how Akbar comes to power is just it shows, you know, what a dangerous situation rulers face and how this guy at a very young age had to deal with this. And that helps us kind of understand uh, who he was and why he acted as he did. So as we're kind of continuing with this theme, right, of how Muslims acted differently depending on their historical context. We just talked about the Safavid Empire, which is very intolerant towards other religions and even intolerant of non-Shia Muslims. The Mughals, especially under Akbar, are going to be completely different. So here's the problem that Akbar faced. 
right? As he uh, came to power and as he expanded his power, he, he was a Muslim ruler ruling a Hindu majority, right? So you had this in the Mughal Empire, you have a Muslim minority ruling a Hindu majority. What's Hinduism? Well, it's a term used to describe various religion, religious traditions in what is now India. But the key thing for us to understand is Hindus could worship many different gods. And one of the most, uh, I think, many people's favorite god in the Hindu pantheon, and I'm not, I'm not joking, I mean, he's very popular, uh, not only in India, but in other places as well, is Ganesh, right? The elephant-headed god. He's kind of god of wisdom and good fortune and wealth and, and all those good things. So Hindus believe that they could worship many different gods, but Muslims thought they could only worship one god, right? You're only supposed to worship one god. So here's the thing, right? This is kind of the problem. The, according then to Islam, traditionally, these are idolaters. They're polyth polytheists, people who worship many gods. They're not people of the book. These are people that you can legitimately kill if they do not convert to Islam, right? So they're not people of the book. You don't have to tolerate them. Uh, you, they don't have to, um, you're not, there's that whole tax thing to keep your religion. That's out the, out the window, so here's the thing, right? You've got this situation where the religion, in a sense, is saying you should be intolerant towards these people because they worship many gods instead of the one true God, right, from the Muslim perspective. But at the same time, this is kind of dangerous because you have a Muslim minority ruling a Hindu majority, right? How can you make these people ch change religions? That seems very dangerous when you're a minority. How do you force the majority to go along with you, right? That's kind of the problem. Uh, that we have here, right? How do you practically rule a group of people um, when you're in the minority and when your religion says that you're supposed to like pressure these people to get them to give up their religion, right? Going beyond just letting them pay a tax, right? But actually, in a sense, calling on you to force them to convert. So young Akbar will have to make a decision. You know, does he try and follow the, uh, his religion, in a sense, to the letter, which would seem to indicate that he needs to uh, take a strong action against Hindus to get them to become Muslims? Or does he have to deal with the practical uh, issue first and foremost, which is he is a member of a Muslim minority ruling a Hindu majority, and if he tries to get Hindus to give up their religion, they might rebel. Uh, it certainly could cause a lot of problems. So he has this question, does he tolerate Hinduism? Or is he going to exert pressure on Hindus to convert to Islam? And in particular, one thing that's going to impact him is that he realizes that Hindus were very attached to their religion. Uh, Hinduism had very deep roots. Uh, Hindus were not simply going to just give up their religion uh, easily. So what's astounding is that Akbar, of course, decides to, of course, tolerate Hinduism. He says this would be bad uh, government policy to do this, to try and force these people uh, to convert to Islam because I know that a lot of them are going to refuse to do so and then, you know, I may have to, to exile them or imprison them or kill them and I don't want to do that. And of course, politically speaking, uh, you know, why do you want to kill people who would, uh, you know, pay taxes and like work for you, right? You know, it just doesn't, it, it's not good for government. A lot of times religious intolerance, you know, just going around killing people uh, or attacking people because they're the wrong religion um, when otherwise they would just be happy to work and pay taxes to you. So, but what's really striking is that Akbar decides not simply that he is going to tolerate um, Hinduism in the way that the Ottomans tolerated Christianity and Judaism by having Christians and Jews pay a tax. He goes further. He allows Hindus to not only keep their religion, he doesn't require them to even pay a tax. So, and it's kind of interesting, right? So on one side, the Safavids, because of their political situation are going to be more intolerant than they're supposed to be. In contrast, the Mughals under Akbar and some successors we'll see will be more tolerant than their religion requires, right? Because uh, unlike the Ottomans who are going to require Jews and Christians to pay a tax to keep their religion, Akbar doesn't care about that. Uh, he doesn't even expect the Hindus to pay a tax to keep their religion. And what's particularly striking is that Akbar will even, in a sense, try and experiment with forming his own religion called the Divine Faith, in which he tries to combine together various uh, different religious traditions. And if you look at that image on the right, that shows uh, Akbar uh, conversing with people of different religions, uh, trying to build some kind of consensus. I just want to point out on the far left, the guys in the blue, those are Jesuits. Uh, they're everywhere, right? We've seen them in China, we've seen them in Japan, now they're India, uh, in India. But the key thing what we want to understand is Akbar's overriding concern 
was maintaining uh, his state, maintaining the Mughals in power, and social order. And if he had tried to follow an intolerant religious policy, that would have been impossible. And one thing that I think is particularly striking is that for uh, Akbar, tolerance does not mean pacifism, right? Sometimes people will kind of confuse these things. Um, Akbar is a conqueror, right? He is going to conquer much of India. And in fact, rather than tolerance and pacifism being opposed, as we might be tempted to think, his tolerance will actually make conquest possible. By tolerating uh, Hinduism, right, by not even requiring Hindus to pay a tax, his, the territory that he has already conquered is going to be more stable. The people are not going to rise up in rebellion against him. Right? If he had tried to force them to convert to Islam, they may have rallied around Hinduism to justify rebellion and caused him all sorts of trouble, which could have prevented him from expanding or even overthrown him. So tolerance is, in a sense, good policy there. It makes it so that his homeland is, uh, or I'm sorry, the areas he's already conquered are stable. But also, the people that he is going to go out and conquer will not fight as hard because they know that even if he conquers them, he's not going to force them to change their religion. Right? People may say, yeah, we don't really mind if, uh, you know, if, if Akbar pushes out our old ruler and conquers us. It's not a big deal because he's not going to make us really change anything. So we're not going to fight that hard against him. Whereas if Akbar had come in and like started destroying Hindu temples and uh, persecuting Hindus, uh, then Hindu people would have said, oh, we need to fight against this guy. So in a sense, not only do tolerance and pacifism not conflict with each other, uh, by bringing social stability, by convincing people he was a good ruler, tolerance will actually help make the massive conquests of Akbar possible. Now, we're used to thinking of tolerance as a good thing. And I think it is a good thing. But as a historian, I, my job is also to complicate things, to show how things are not always so simple. So to do that, I'm going to give you the example of Sati. Right? This image here is depicting Sati. You will notice there are two people here. Uh, there is a husband, that's the person lying down, and then that's his wife, that's the woman sitting up. And they're surrounded with fire. And what has happened is the husband has died, and Hindus, because uh, in part because of their beliefs in the impermanence of the visible world and their belief in reincarnation, uh, typically cremate their dead. So he has died and is being cremated. The woman, out of loyalty and love for her husband, has thrown herself on the funeral pyre so that she can be burned along with him. So she is very much alive, but in this picture is showing uh, her devotion to him by, be, uh, by being burned along with him. Though, of course, uh, he's dead and she's alive. And this is uh, a practice called sati, right? This uh, idea of this woman... Uh, out of devotion and love to her husband when he dies of choosing to follow him into the afterlife by allowing herself to be burned with his body. So this is, I think, uh, for many uh, Americans, this is, of course, kind of a, a shocking uh, practice. Um, but for people in India, this was considered, you know, the utmost of female devotion. It was considered a pious act, a religious act, which showed um, kind of good religious values and faith that you're willing to follow your husband in this way. Now, from the point of view of Muslim Muslims, you should not do this. This is suicide. Islam, much like Christianity and Judaism, forbids suicide, right? Uh, life is God's gift. It's to be taken when God wants it to be taken, not in this way, right? You're not supposed to take your own life. So Muslim rulers were bothered by this because this was suicide. Similarly, one thing I have to, to stress, too, is that not all women did this voluntarily, uh, the problem was when a husband died, you know, if a woman didn't have uh, children, uh, adult children to take care of her and support her, who would do that? Right? This is kind of a, a lot of traditional societies are patriarchal. It's very hard for a woman to get by alone. And sometimes it was just decided, especially if a woman didn't have children to take care of her, it would be nice if she just went away. And this is a way of doing this. So sometimes women uh, that the, the rest of the family didn't want them around anymore, when their husband died, they those women would be pressured to um, engage in, in, in sati. So you would have women who were pressured or even forced to be burned along with their husbands who didn't want to do the act, but were pressured by their families to do so because they didn't want to support them. They didn't want that financial burden. Um, and sometimes women were drugged with opium or other drugs and thrown on to the pyre without their uh, permission. And other times uh, women might even be tied up 
and thrown onto the funeral pyre again without their permission. And then that goes then from suicide to murder, right? You know, when you're, when you're pressuring these women, when you're forcing them to do this, this is a major problem. So here's kind of the issue, right? This was understood as a religious act, but from a Muslim, uh, for Hindus, from a Muslim religious perspective, this is wrong because it's either suicide at best or murder at worst. So it's easy, like I said, we think about tolerance and we say, oh, well, tolerance is a good thing. But how do you tolerate something that seems wrong, right? How does that go together? And that was an issue that the Mughal emperors had to deal with. And we're going to look now at one Mughal emperor who had to deal with this problem. And I think this shows this kind of complexity. And that's this man, Jahangir. He was a Mughal emperor. He was a successor to Akbar. And I'm going to read to you, and this is the text on the right. This is an edict that he issued. Um, in the practice of being burnt on the funeral pyre of their husbands, that's Sati, as sometimes exhibited among the widows of the Hindus, I have previously directed that no woman who was the mother of children should be thus made a sacrifice, however willing to die. So he, he was trying to deal with this. He didn't like it, uh, this, this practice. So one thing he did was he said, well, women who have children should not do this, right? He, he, he didn't get rid of the practice completely, but he did try and restrict it. He did try and, and make it limited. And this makes sense in a, a, you know, you can say practically speaking, because, you know, if the woman dies, especially if she's young, who's going to take care of the children, right? They'll just become orphans and, you know, will either be a burden on other people or might become, uh, you know, become thieves or something to support themselves, you know, you know, children need parents or else there's going to be, that, that, that's going to cause problems or it's certainly going to be a pity. Um, but of course, also, you know, this would pr protect older women uh, whose children just didn't want to take care of them, right? You would have women who were older and their ch kids didn't want to take care of them. So they were just, you know, like, okay, mom, just go ahead and, and uh, we'll get rid of you this way. And so it has a kind of a practical bent. But if we continue on, he says, and I now further ordain that in no case is the practice to be permitted when compulsion is in the slightest degree employed. So now he's trying to go even further and say, now it, it doesn't, um, uh, I'm going to also restrict it so that if there's any kind of pressure, that's illegal, you can be punished. Right. And what I think is really striking is the next part, whatever might be the opinions of the people. In a sense, Jahan Gir understands that this is going to be unpopular among some of his subjects, right? And I think you can see the kind of complexities here of being a ruler. Like it's easy from our perspective to say, well, just be tolerant. But what if toleration, toleration means allowing something that you think is wrong, right? Do you want to sit back and tolerate, you know, innocent women who made no choice, right? You, you, you know, at the, uh, when you're talking about women being forced to do this, you know, this seems really wrong. Like I said, it's murder. Are you going to sit back and do nothing? But at the same time, and this is the problem Jahan Gear faced, and you can see this in that second line, if you go too far, the people might rebel and overthrow you. And in that case, you can't do anything good, right? You can't, you know, then people just have all the Saudi they want. So Jahan is trying to walk this thin line. He wants as a ruler to maintain social order, to maintain stability. That means following a policy of tolerance. But as a devout Muslim, he believes that it is, is his duty to protect his subjects, to prevent them from being killed, even if they're weak. And that's one thing I want to want to stress. He's whisking, risking rebellion to protect women who are often very in a very weak social situation. These are not women, you know, by him doing this, it's not like he's winning like powerful supporters by trying to protect these women. He's not. They're weak in society. But his religious beliefs about the sanctity of life are leading him to protect women who are often marginalized and weak in society simply because it's the right thing to do, right? He thinks it's the right thing to do and he's willing uh, to try and risk things for that, to, right? to risk his throne, to risk uh, social stability. So like I say, I want us to kind of appreciate the, the difficulties of tolerance and the difficulties uh, that rulers face, right? That they want to do what's good for the social order. They want to maintain their power, but also just like anyone else, they have morals, you know, they have beliefs and they want to, and in this case, I think it's very praiseworthy that Jahangir wants to protect people uh, who are in a weak position. So I hope we can appreciate the complexity of that situation. Now, the Mughals, uh, after Akbar, into Jahangir's reign and later, will continue to expand. 
Uh, they will borrow technology from Europe, particularly cannons and the guns, but they do not adopt the ideas behind it, uh, similar to the Ottomans and the Chinese. Uh, they're willing to make use of technology, but that willingness to make use of technology does not mean that they focus on the uh, science that makes that possible. So they don't ever really see the need in this time period to develop a scientific revolution. Uh, in addition, they, uh, the Mughal Empire, because of their great wealth, and you have a, a, on the right, I have a picture of a woman who is uh, manufa or is uh, kind of uh, refining cotton, getting cotton ready to be made into cloth. India was world famous for its cotton cloth, and people from all over the world would come there to buy it, including people from Europe. And so India is profiting from international trade, and they become fabulously wealthy, much wealthier than Europe. But the key thing is then, um, because they're so wealthy, they don't really see a need to go out and explore, right? And all these people are coming to see them. They don't need to develop to explore or develop a strong Navy. So one thing we have to understand about China, uh, Japan, Korea, and these Islamic civilizations is in a sense, their very wealth, their very power makes it so they tend to emphasize stability and they don't want to emphasize development. They don't need to develop because they're already so wealthy and so powerful, right? Their power, their wealth actually discourages development. Why go out exploring? Exploring is dangerous and it can get you killed. You need to, uh, why not just sit back and let other people come, uh, bring goods to you and buy your stuff and make you rich, right? So this power, this wealth will actually discourage Mughals like the Ottomans and, and like the people in East Asia from developing uh, science and uh, all those other things that the Europeans will develop. Now, the uh, Mughal Empire will continue to expand, um, in particular under this man, Aurangzeb. But Aurangzeb, um, he reveals to us the wisdom, in a sense, of the policy of religious tolerance by ceasing to follow <laughs> the policy of religious tolerance, right? Um, he's going to stop following that. He is a strictly Orthodox Muslim. Uh, you may remember we saw that image a while back of uh, Akbar talking to all these people of different religions. Um, I don't want to make too much of just two different pictures, but notice Aurangzeb is uh, not pictured doing that. He's pictured reading a book, and of course he's reading the Quran. So he is this very orthodox Muslim. He wants to unify his realm and expand, and the way he thinks he can do that is through being stricter about Islam. Right? He wants to unify his realm by converting more people to Islam. Right? I'm going to, uh, you know, I have the right religion. Uh, let's get these other people to convert to Islam. And that will unify my, my realm, unify my state. And based on that, I can then expand further. I can make uh, uh, ex expand my conquests. So, um, and part of that, what he's going to do is institute a religious tax on Hindus. And he um, will now require Hindus who want to keep uh, following Hinduism to pay a tax. And that is very unpopular. But the idea is he wants to pressure them to eventually become Muslims. And also, of course, he can use the money from that religious tax to do things like expand his empire. And he will also attempt to enforce Islamic orthodoxy by doing things like destroying Hindu temples. So this will create a lot of resistance from non-Muslims. Uh, a lot of Hindus and other religious people in, in India who aren't Muslims do not like this and will resist Aurangzeb. Now, he's a scary guy and really, really strong and really powerful. And so he's actually able to hold things together. But when he dies that's when things start to fall apart because um, that's when all the rage, all the anger um, will really start to express itself. There's going to be um, rebellions. There's going to be internal conflict and that will lead the Mughal empire to fall apart. Right? So it turns out uh, Aurangzeb was, uh, uh, we can understand the wisdom of Akbar's policy in terms of making a government that could, could last, right? Akbar and his succe uh, initial successors followed this policy of religious tolerance that worked pretty well. And then when Aurangzeb departs from that, that's going to lead eventually to the decline and disintegration of his empire. And what that means is in India, you're going to have a weak government, right? Because uh, the uh, Mughal empire will fall apart into multiple different governments that will fight each other. But India stays wealthy. So it's kind of like having a really rich house, but no one there to, but there's no lock on the door and there's no alarm. And there's no one to defend the house. Someone's going to come in and rob the house, right? So India is a weak state but has a lot of wealth, people are going to come in and invade, and we'll see later it's going to be the British who will do that. So in conclusion, we can see the power, wealth, and in some places, particular interpretation of Islam prevented interest in developing science or exploring. That will leave open the opportunity for Europe, for Western Christian civilization, to do those things.
and that will lead to them to eventually be able to overtake the East Asian civilizations and the Islamic empires as the foremost power uh, in the world by the 19th century.